Welcome to another edition of Consensus Unreality. Before we get into today's episode, we want to invite you to join us over at patreon.com slash consensus unreality, where we host exclusive episodes, discussions, feedback experiments, written content, and much more. We are planning to move over some of the kind of stuff that we'll put on the main cast uh, on over to the Patreon. We're going to expand it a little bit, have a little bit more of everything we've been doing already, and it's sort of the best way you can support us. It's $5 a month, and if you like what we do over here in the free podcasts, uh, yeah, you'll be seeing a lot more of that kind of stuff over on Patreon, and it's the best way to support Ben and David of Consensus Unreality. So here is another beautiful episode. (laughs) Again, I don't know. Here's the episode. Welcome to episode 49 of Consensus Unreality. We're joined here today by uh, Recluse, a.k.a. Steven Snyder, the mind behind the Vise Up View blog and the podcast The Farm, both of which are essential in this ecosystem of ours. And uh, we're going to talk about a few different things here today, uh, some sort of Midwestern magical weirdness and maybe a few other various things of interest to us all but um first i kind of just wanted to see what you've been up to uh steven and how everything's going what are you reading right now how's life on the farm well it's uh pretty good you know um for those of you who've been following the farm and some of my other musings lately you know i've been doing like a lot of traveling uh so far this year i've done i think like three sort of major series of trips uh it's taken me out to the glorious state of Wisconsin twice to play Odo Karma in, in uh, Mexico. Uh, it's taken me back out to Utah again and uh, the occult uh, metropolis of Cincinnati, among other places. So that's been uh, really exciting. Uh, I mean, as always, I've been reading all kinds of crazy stuff. I, it was like I was telling you before, I just finished a uh, biography of Lewis Terman today, who was the uh, the principal architect of the gifted program and yeah. um, started a book on Victor Hugo and his kind of dabblings with spirits and what have you in preparation for the farm Zoom party on Friday. So that's going to be some cool stuff. Clowns. Yes. Clowns have been on the brain a lot, actually. That's, that's going to so be a weird. big thing uh, when I do the Zoom party on Friday. <laughs> I just, yeah, I just sent Dave a picture of a clown holding a revolver, pointing it at the viewer. And I said, we should use this for a graphic for an episode. And he was like, yeah, if we do a psycho clown episode someday. <laughs> and now you mentioned clowns. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I'm going to go all out on the freaking evil clown archetype on Friday, man. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Um, I guess, yeah, the last time we had you on was, you put out a book since then, uh, the Epstein book. And... So I guess, yeah, last time we were talking about like ARGs and like QAnon and stuff. Which was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm still working on the book on that one too. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's definitely been quite a journey with all that good stuff. Um, yeah. just, I keep finding like more information to put in there. I mean, it's such a, you know, a fascinating milieu. And I suppose we'll probably delve into some of this, I guess, when we get into Kenneth Grant tonight. So mm, yeah, totally. I just, I drove past uh, Ong's hat. Oh really? Yeah, oh, so you're out in so New Jersey then, huh? Yeah. In that area, I was I was in I was just kind of driving around the Pine Barrens area. We're we're in Pennsylvania, but oh really? So okay, far, okay, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. you're not too far then from me. I'm in uh, Cape and Bridge, West Virginia, which isn't. Uh, do you know where Cumberland, yeah, yeah. Maryland is? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm about an hour from Cumberland, so. Nice. Yeah. So, within that strange, uh, I don't. I want to say it but yeah liminal, yeah kind of, uh, it's definitely an area. interesting place man <laughs> drop the the, yeah, li- had, the liminals and, word. yeah yeah i mean yeah. i was uh i was listening to you on aon bite as i had mentioned uh before we started recording um and you were talking about making some pilgrimages out to um 
some sites uh, where certain magical workings had been performed, um, specifically involving uh, the influence of Kenneth Grant, um, the Bait Cabal, who is uh, something that's a pretty interesting group that um, we talk about from time to time, uh, coming out of that Cincinnati hub that you mentioned before. Um, and it's it's kind of strange too because I, I went back I went to the Serpent Mound around two, 2017 um, and I'll actually be going back out there in a couple weeks um, and to hear you talking about those areas and those those power zones um, I think you mentioned Harrington Lake as well and yeah Harrington Lake's right down there <laughs> um, so yeah have you been visiting some of those sites uh, what do you, what have you been making of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been kind of an ongoing process, but I mean, yeah, I was um, really um, interested in um, the some of the different groups that Kenneth Grant had been working with uh, during the 1970s. Um, I don't know how familiar your listeners are with this, but Grant was um, obviously an accolade of Aleister Crowley. Mm -hmm. Um, He didn't, he started, of course, a lot of his major magical workings in the 1950s, but he really did not publish very much of the stuff until the 1970s. His first book, Magic Revival, I think came out like in 72 or something like that. So anyway, he was the first guy to really start making, making a linkage between the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft an actual like ceremonial magic um of course lovecraft had already been going through a bit of revival during the 1960s but grant has you know long insisted that he was looking at this you know since as far back as the 1950s maybe even further and then concurrently um supposedly independent of what grant was doing uh, colonel michael aquino when he was um with the church of satan in 72 73 also came up with his own uh, Lovecraftian kind of ceremonial magic. Uh, one was, I think, they called the Cthulhu, and then the other one was like the uh, the Ritual of the Nine Angles or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So uh, Aquino had actually beaten Grant to the punch in terms of you know formalizing a ritual approach to Lovecraft, but Grant had far more long lasting influence, and it came through these different magical circles that had started to uh, contact him. You know, beginning in the seventies. Uh, you mentioned one of them, which was the Bait Cabal. They were centered around um, the enigmatic figure of Nima. Uh, I believe her actual name was, what was it? Uh, Margie Idris or something like that. Mm-hmm. But um, they had, I believe, first uh, come in contact with some grants writings around 73 or something like that. And not long afterwards, they had... Uh, performed the initial ritual um, in Brown County, Ohio, which is where they thought that they had made contact with what they dubbed as the Forgotten Ones, which mm-hmm. Grant later linked to the sort of Lovecraftian old ones, if you will. Uh, it's interesting, too. Apparently, it uh, happened at a farm, I believe, that was called Oz in Brown County, Ohio. So that was a, a nice touch, I suppose. Um, and then later they did a couple of other ritual workings and around uh, what they dubbed the Cincinnati Vortex. And um, according to the Penny Royal guys, I mean, this stretched all the way from Cincinnati proper all the way down into kind of like the Somerset area. So Harrington Lake uh, was one of these ritual sites that um, supposedly they used. And then allegedly another one. Uh, was the cemetery in Cincinnati, Spring Grove. Um, and these two sites really couldn't have as, as different of a lineage as you could possibly try. Um, Harrington Lake was just a totally contemporary construction. It was created as a result of the Dix Dam, I think, that was put up like in the 1920s or 30s like that. So it's totally artificial structure, okay? Like it has no real lineage or anything like that that I'm aware of, uh, unless something there happened that predated the uh, the dam or something to that effect. Uh, but nonetheless, by the 1970s, it had already started to get its own, you know, history of like a sea monster or something there, the eel pig or right. something like yeah, that. Yeah. So, which is interesting. We're going to, you know, as we go through this, we're going to hear a lot of like reports about cryptids and things like that. But it's kind of yeah. interesting how you see a reoccurrence of a lot of cryptid creatures um, in areas uh, that the Bake Ball and some of these other, you know, kind of Lovecraftian circles been linked to. And then, you know, sort of interesting, too, uh, in terms of, like, uh, more serious things that were happening. Um, there was a company that was operating there in the 1970s um, called Triad 
that uh, was part of a crime syndicate that was literally dubbed the company. And this was mm. comprised almost entirely of former um, military and law enforcement officers from around Louisville and Kentucky and the Lexington area. And um, this outfit eventually became involved in Iran-Contra with the Medellin cartel, a lot of really serious stuff. So they're running this training facility out there by Harrington Lake. Uh, supposedly they were training Libyans, Nicaraguans, but um, there were also reports from locals of devil worshippers also receiving paramilitary training, which mm. is, again, really interesting because this yeah. does coincide roughly with the time frame. The Baker Ball would have been out there performing rituals and such as well. So, it's <laughs> you know, it's really weird, to put it mildly. Yeah. So that's kind of like the whole scene that's like unfolding at Harrington Lake in the 1970s with the Baker ball running around there. And then the other big spot that they were using um, from what I was told by the Penny Royal guys was at the Spring Grove Cemetery in uh, Cincinnati. And this is a really amazing structure. It's a national historical landmark um, for very good reason. Uh, it, it it's, I think, the third largest cemetery in the entire country. The architecture is just incredible. There's all kinds of obelisks, mausoleums, all kinds of very occult-centric um, headstones and so forth in there. It's just amazing on so many levels. It's I've been to some pretty fancy graveyards in my day. I've been to the one in Casadega. I've been to the one in Savannah that was in Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And this place is just on another level. It's enormous. Um, and it does have a very interesting lineage. Um, one of the major families behind it was uh, the Pendleton family, uh, who went back to the American Revolutionary War. They were hereditary members of the Society of Cincinnati. They intermarried with the family of Francis Scott Kay, who wrote the um, was it the Star Spangled Banner. Um, they continued to be a major powerhouse all the way up to the late 19th, early 20th century. And, uh, you know, they had a lot of these kind of interesting connections. Um, I think also another... Uh, there was another family, I believe, connected to the Society of Cincinnati. Well, there are quite a few in there, but another one, I think, that it also helped up set one of the fraternities at Yale. Uh, the Society of Cincinnati doesn't get, like, a lot of uh, love, if you will, like, in the conspiratorial um, kind of subculture, even though it was really a big deal at the founding of the country. Um, you know, quite a few of the Revolutionary War officers, including George Washington, were members, and it had an enormous influence on the um, the actual ratification of the Constitution. And it was instrumental in settling the Northwestern Territory. I mean, that's a big reason why Cincinnati, the city, is named after it. And it has continued as a hereditary society up to this present day. Um, I actually just went out to uh, their headquarters at Anderson House in Washington, D.C. about uh, two or three weeks ago. I've been to the Scottish Rite Temple in D.C., the really famous one, and um, yeah. the Society of Cincinnati headquarters blows it out of the freaking water, man, for just a cold huh. symbolism and stuff. It is insane. Wow. Um, interestingly, one of the members of the Society, too, is the architect, uh, Le Finte, I think, the one who uh, was principally responsible for designing the layout of Washington, D.C., and that kind of weird oh, wow. architecture. He's also the one who designed the emblem of the Society of Cincinnati. So they're, you know, a really interesting group. I mean, they had such an enormous uh, presence in Cincinnati. I mean, a lot of the yeah. sort of Romanesque architecture was influenced by them and just very much the whole perception of, you know, America as the new Rome was something that really originated very much with that group. And um, also the uh, legacy, I guess, of Fox military coup d'etats and so forth that were very important in the early history of this country that they were a part of. Um, that's a topic I'm going to be getting into on the farm here, hopefully very soon, but uh, it nice, ties into yeah. things like Shays Rebellion and the Whiskey Rebellion and a lot of early history mm -hmm. that people just don't understand what happened there, really. Yeah. So um, that's crazy. I, I had a, just a quick, weird thing that popped into my mind about Cincinnati. Um, have you come? I don't, maybe I haven't seen it pop up on the farm stuff, but like, have you been looking into the John Uri Lloyd and his sort of weird? Oh, uh, the, the the stuff about the underground. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We were actually going to go to his house when we were visiting yeah. Cincinnati, but it was by appointment only. So we didn't get a right. chance to do it this time. We're going to try to do that next time. But um, Cause he has yeah, this weird. The, what do you call it? The He was like this pharmacist. And then 
<laughs> the people who ended up with the rights to his company are the Eli Lilly company. Most yeah, recently. yeah, yeah. I think he actually <laughs> might be buried in Spring Grove Cemetery too. Yeah, that's I'm what mistaken. reminded me of it. Yeah, I think he is. But I mean, yeah, no, that's like another sort of weird thing that came out of Cincinnati. But again, it doesn't surprise me because, yeah. you know, again, OK, so the city was founded basically by the Society of Cincinnati. Uh, it's one of the longest, most powerful families that have lived there is the Taft family. Um, of course, Alfonso Taft is one of the founders of Skull and Bones. Um, and then, like I said, another one of the big Yale fraternities. It's not Scroll and Key. It's the other one besides Scroll and Key and Skull and Bones was founded by another guy from Cincinnati, um, or at least co-founded, I think, partly. So, uh, yeah, it, it's just that whole city is just so awash in secret societies i mean there's also a strong catholic slash jesuit presence there there's also a really strong uh mystical jewish presence there too i mean that was one of the things that i got into in the um dispatches from the cold cincinnati and the farms patreon was sort of the presence of uh what was it isaac muir i think wise muir who was there um essentially the creator of reform judaism and also a major figure in kabbalahism and the talmud and all that kind of stuff stuff so th- there's just all kinds of stuff with cincinnati i mean long before the bake of all that whole right. city was just absolutely steeped in occultism and then right, right. of course it's right there in the midst of the ohio valley i mean that's just a wash and a lot of these major you know native american structures i mean serpent mounds mm-hmm. one another one is uh, grave creek Mound, mm-hmm. west virginia yeah it's another one i went to recently back in november but i mean it's you know another really impressive structure yeah that's um, a fascinating spot with the uh grave creek tablet um that you know apparently has phoenician text on it um people can't well, that was that was actually probably a masonic hoax right. um that one was... I, yeah because that one i feel like is contested right like i know there was mm. other uh, there was a history of fake relics you know tied to mormonism and whatnot and that whole joseph smith concept of the lost tribe yeah that's something else we're going to be getting into a lot in the farm here in a couple of uh, coming episodes too but um what is interesting though about grave creek mound is the the prison that is directly across (laughs) the street from at the moundsville prison which Mm -hmm. is where a i mean just the architecture there is amazing i mean it's done up like a gothic man or uh, cathedral an cathedral um, um um castle essentially and uh it was where the state of west virginia did uh its executions for many years i mean you know literally they had people come out there on sundays to watch people be <laughs> right. hanged all the way up to the 1930s and it's again right across the street from yeah. this you know massive native american shrine where you're going all of these executions <laughs> you know i can't emphasize the importance of some of this stuff enough i mean you know and then again if you've been to the the, you know the prison there i mean you've seen probably the star and some of the other stuff that indicates that again secret societies were probably involved in setting it up and... Mm. yeah and charlie was there for a cup of coffee too right i think charlie... um not charles manson but his mother was oh i see okay yeah. right right his mother was yeah yeah and he did used to visit the uh the prison at moundsville when he was a child so yeah there was um <laughs> A lot of weird stuff about that whole area man uh yeah i did a i did a tour of that prison uh it's pretty pretty spooky looking at that gallows knowing how many people got tossed on that one but yeah it's It's also i mean it's supposedly one of the most haunted spots (laughs) in the uh, country too i mean it was one of the first sightings of a shadow man occurred there a lot of other stuff and um I suppose now, man, it's almost uh, become intertwined in pop culture because it was, um, what is it, Castle Rock? I think that's Mm. the Stephen Mm -hmm. King show. They actually were using the Moundsville prison as a stand-in for Shawshank for the exterior shot. So now it's kind of like in the group mind, it's become associated with Stephen King's Shawshank prison to boot. Um, Right. It's really fascinating. Um man, I really want to ask you a little bit more about Grant. Cause I think Grant is just like this really fascinating character. Um, uh, I, I know a lot of people just kind of see him as the aftermath of Crowley, but he does have a really interesting style of, you know, interpreting the idea of like meta fiction, fiction and the occult and, and kind of, I, I think Crowley actually criticized him for that saying that he had no stake in reality, that he was just kind of believing and, 
aloof fantasies or something like that. But uh, did you read a lot of Grant or did you kind of get to him in like a roundabout way through more like parapolitical stuff? Uh, it's only recently that I've read a lot of Grant's stuff, but yeah, like upon reading Grant, I mean, he's so profoundly influential in like ways that I don't think people have scarcely considered. But I mean, I think in a lot of ways, uh, his influence is probably greater than Crowley's, but Grant, I mean, tended to credit a lot of his concepts to Crowley, but whether or not they did come from Crowley is like a matter of debate. I mean, again, you know, for instance, like the whole thing with equating Crowley's system with like extraterrestrials, which was a big thing that Grant did. Yeah. You know, again, it's debatable if that's what Crowley was really getting at when he talked about aliens, like in his writings and stuff like that. Uh, but Grant was unequivocal on that point, And that was controversial within some of the Thelema uh, community. I mean, this is why it's such a big falling out with McGurdy or something like that. Um, <laughs> You know, he was very controversial in his interpretations of Crowley, and that's one of the reasons why uh, he really didn't have much of a presence here in the United States for a lot of years. I mean, the, you know, the Thelemic movement here in the U.S. was dominated by the, the so-called Caliphate, mm. the version of the OTO that uh, Magruder... McCrudy, I always forget his name, was overseeing out of California, like, in the, uh, you know, pretty much at the time of his death. Um, so yeah, but Grant was so endlessly fascinating, like you're saying, how you try to combine like a lot of this metafiction and so forth. But like in terms of just the ideology that are some of the concepts that he's influenced that I don't think are really understood, a big one would probably be like Michael A. Hoffman and William Grimstead, mm. for instance. Right. Right. I mean, Absolutely. a lot of people, you know, there's a um there's some good indications that Hoffman was actually a part of the OTO, like around 73 in New York. <laughs> Uh, which, and again, the OTO in New York City was one of the only branches that actually was really looking at Grant's stuff back then. And just with uh, a lot of the stuff that Hoffman and Grimstead were getting at uh, with some of their work, I mean, the whole sort of notions of Twilight language and what have you, I definitely think that this was strongly influenced by a lot of the writings that Grant was uh, yeah. you know, doing in the 70s. Uh, it's just really obvious to me, I mean, upon looking at this stuff after having read Grant, that this is where Hoffman was getting a lot of his concepts from. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really interesting. I mean, yesterday I was just kind of just uh, fingering through Hecate's Fountain, and uh, I believe it's in that one where Grant is talking about Marjorie Cameron and, and Marjorie Cameron as a witch and her connection to native american groups who had direct lineage with the old ones you know and i could see that being a direct influence on something like the rebirth of pan where it kind of uh dismisses a lot of the intricacies of of history and anthropology and and kind of formulates more of a a roundabout field theory um that you know kind of can be problematic at times i suppose but uh if if, in the least but uh yeah i don't know yeah yeah, I, I, Grant's just such a complicated character. It, it seems like it depends who you read, like which which uh, side of the you know the the dice you're looking at, like what to make of him. You know, Cause mm-hmm. even Peter Lavenda often kind of characterizes Grant as um, putting forth a warning, essentially, like warning about making contact with these things, and uh, but then at the same time he's uh, putting out processes and procedures for like making contact with the old ones so it's kind of a muddled zone yeah well i mean certainly and this is like pretty much everybody that's involved with this kind of stuff and i mean it's it really is like a mind fuck i mean especially you know to when you sort of like uh, kind of go into how some of this intersects with like the history of discordianism as well because mm. again like is it goes like when Grant started his major workings with the new ISIS lodge, like around 1955 or something like that. I mean, they had a couple of major revelations by like around 57 or something like that. And um, this is, you know, roughly concurrently the same time that Carrie Thornley and Greg Hill were supposedly visited by heiress in the form of like a bamboon or something like that at a bowling alley in Hollywood, California. And it seems absurd that this kind of stuff would 
would be interrelated. But again, if you've read a lot of Grant's writings, you know that this whole concept of sort of the divine ape of Thoth, which is also yeah. often personified as the fool, is a big part of their concept. Yeah. Because this is a representation of the twin earth, which is basically what you're trying to do when you this, you know, supposedly I think where the old ones are and what you're trying to do when you go through the twin, you know, the night side tree of life and all this other yeah. shit. So <laughs> they suddenly okay, so okay, imagine this. Okay, Grant is suddenly picking up on this stuff, so he claims at these seances or whatever the fuck it is he's doing in England around 57. Greg Hill and Carrie Thornley then are also visited by Eris in the form of like a bamboo or something like that. They come up with this whole thing, you know, the justified ancient order of Moo Moo. Moo Moo is actually one of the names that Grant later uses for like some of the uh, deities in his system. Uh, and then later, I mean, there's just more intersections with some of this stuff. I mean, of course, Robert Anton Wilson had his famous, uh, you know, crossing of the abyss, night of the dark soul or what have you beginning in 73, 74, after he did the Crowley light rituals, they ended on the dog day. Uh, what was it? July 23rd. You yep. know what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Man. And then, and so, okay, so 74, okay, three years later to the day, another one of Grant's acolytes uh, who was involved with workings in D.C. and Miami that we haven't gotten to yet supposedly had his contact with his holy guardian angel on July 23rd, 1977 in Washington, D.C., three years to the day after Robert Anton Wilson had his moment. So it's just... And then, of course, like in the early years uh, with the New York uh, branch of uh, the OTO that was into Grant that the Simon Necronomicon came out of, they were intersecting with the Discordian community. They were using it to promote the Simon Necronomicon. And who could forget the longstanding friendship between Alan Greenfield and Gary Thornley? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, Greenfield was another big uh, devotee of Grant and all this other stuff. So it's just... (laughs) You know, again, it's one of these things like it's so weird. And I mean, I've asked a lot of these Thelemics about this, too. They're always quick to freaking bash Discordianism, although they always seem to hang out with Discordians, want to latch themselves onto their movement. But it's just so odd how they've intersected with each other. There was this sort of mutual obsession with Lovecraft in both movements and just in general, the whole concept of how fiction could be used to alter reality, which is a big part, I think, of both systems as well. And just the kind of deification of this almost, you know, evil clownishness, if you will. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, man, it's crazy because... You know, I was reading about uh, the nine channeling group last night, and even in that, the the channeler Doctor Vinod um, is reciting this parable about the fool ape to the nine channeling group with uh, Andrija Puharik and stuff. So, man, it's odd how <laughs> these sinks, if they're sinks, come up within these circles. The fool stuff. ape is a big thing, man, and it's a big part of why all these groups are fucking so into clowns, man. It's why Sufis <laughs> dress up like clowns. It's why the Shriners basically created their yeah. own inner cult about clowns, the Royal Order of the Jesters. Right. Huh. Yeah, that's crazy. And then, <laughs> what, what does that make Planet of the Apes? Some sort of... <laughs> I guess that's where we live. Um, yeah. That's wild. Do you think... Do you think Grant well, actually, is like, yeah. Actually, Altered States would be oh. a good example of that. <laughs> That's like, right. Okay, you, you guys are familiar with the movie, right? I'm assuming oh, yeah. a lot of people listening to this have yeah. probably seen it. But I mean, yeah, yeah. okay, so that, I think, is really almost based around Grant's concept of mm-hmm. consciousness and like what you would theoretically be accessing, you know, from this like twin earth that I've been talking about. Because in theory there like time is not unfolding in a linear fashion rather you can see all time you know everything that's happened all at once and it's the same thing with consciousness you can see all states of consciousness from its primordial beginnings to its higher forms and so forth so in altered states when william hurt's character starts to go through the entheogenic process and so forth the first time he transforms into that ape-like creature Mm. that's your sort of divine ape of thoth right there that's 
like that kind of primordial consciousness that existed at the dawn or the beginning or whatever then we kind of came out of like uh the abyss of the primordial chaos at the beginning right. all right and that's also sort of <laughs> like an alchemy you know the beginning what uh the uh, primordial man that has to be perfected through the pr- mm. spiritual process and then when you get to the end of the movie You've got Hertz character where he's basically foregone his body altogether and is kind of transformed into this entity of pure consciousness. Mm. And in Grant's cosmology, that's like where we're going, you know, this almost divine godlike consciousness. But I mean, in, you know, in theory, this sort of alternate earth outside the tree or after you've gone through the night side tree of life, you know, you could experience both forms of these consciousness at once simultaneously. And I kind of think like with altered states, that's almost the fictional representation of like how, you know, you're going through this process of accessing these different states of consciousness through the different evolutionary uh, spheres that uh, in theory we are going through. Yeah. Do you think, um, I I mean, so uh, Patty Chayefsky, I guess, was the author of the book upon which the movie was based. Do you Mm -hmm. think, and I guess the movie's Ken Russell, who was you know into all kinds of weird stuff with uh the, the devil, devil. don't underestimate crazy. patty though man i mean i don't yeah. know if you guys ever saw a uh, network but there's some really like deep stuff in that Is, well. yeah it, maybe a while ago do you think and i guess it was pretty heavily based on john c Lilly's kind of experiments right like mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. do you think that yeah i wonder if there's some sort of and Lilly's stuff is so much about consciousness as well um like that sort of transcendent yeah. no yeah. i definitely think patty was like aware of a lot of this stuff uh mm. when he started working on the book and the script but i mean even when you sort of get back like into network you know i mean because it was a big serious movie that won a lot of oscars most people tend to interpret it through a very secular prism which i think is a gross mistake especially mm. considering that he followed it up with freaking altered states but i mean right. you know basically i mean the whole film revolves around the character howard beale mm. again beale beale okay a very loaded name right there Mm. uh essentially has a breakdown or what he thinks is a spiritual uh, experience where a voice you know starts speaking to him and starts telling him things to say on air and this leads to his really famous i'm mad as hell and i'm not going to take it anymore speech you know which i you know essentially launches kind of like a populist movement and so forth so again it's you know a really interesting movie i mean again everybody wants to just look at this from a secular perspective but you know you've got to ask the question what if he really is possessed and what if that's what you know patty was really getting at with the movie i mean again in light of what he later did with altered states i think it's an interpretation that has to be seriously considered Mm -hmm. and it's kind of fascinating too like uh there's that really famous scene with ned Beatty uh where he talks to uh, howard beale it's basically the scene that won ned Beatty and austin or even though he's only in the movie for like 10 minutes where he's like you have traveled with the forces of nature mr <laughs> beale and you must atone it's really interesting because he's like the wealthiest most powerful figure in the entire movie everybody else that acts like howard beale is insane he actually doesn't seem to think that he's insane. Right, right. And even after like his Beale's ratings start to plummet, he insists on keeping him in the air to administer, um, you know, Beatty's character's corporatist uh, message that he uh, puts into Beale. It's just really fascinating with the dynamics in that. It kind of reminds me how uh, Chris Knowles always likes to emphasize that um, millionaires believe in um, astronomy, but billionaires believe in astrology. Mm. Uh, I definitely <laughs> think that's very much like what patty was getting yeah. out a network man i have to watch that again with that i haven't seen that in quite oh a it's a great movie years. and yeah. like i said there's there's so Quite many different ways you can look at it too i mean it's it's one of my all-time favorite movies certainly yeah. yeah i'm sure i just watched it with like the just like looking at it as like an oscar winner when i was like a teenager or something but yeah i should watch it with that in mind yeah, yeah. that's wild yeah yeah huh. i mean that that looking at the movie through that lens too uh, harkens interestingly back to like Iwas and Lamb and stuff and giving credence to these supernatural voices guiding political movements, very political writings like the Book of the Law and stuff. Oh, yeah. And I mean, of course, you almost have like 
feels like sacrificial murder at the end where they get <laughs> right. that like what is it the you know the group that's based on the weather underground i think or the you know mm. the Sivanese liberation army essentially to go in there and shoot him on air like literally why he's in the middle of a broadcast and yeah uh I mean, I, yeah that's crazy um what do you think of so you, you mentioned the sort of ape aspect of thoth how do you think that might relate to like the the bird, the ibis, ibis aspect of it. I wonder if like, cause that's sort of the more, when, when the, the popular image of Thoth is often this sort of bird headed figure, right? With like the, uh, the pad that it's right, the iPad that it's writing on. Um, do you, what have you thought, or yeah, have you thought much about the, that, like the dual aspect of it? Not as much with the bird, but I mean, it's possible. I mean, who knows? Maybe that kind of plays into some of the Native American symbolism right. with like the great horned serpent and the mm. thunderbirds and what have you. I mean, that's that's kind of another interesting thing. I mean, about a lot of the sites, you know, around the Bay of all, of course, um, they're in that whole area in, uh, you know, Ohio Valley where you've got all of those Native American mounds and within mm. the Adena and the Hopewell cultures that dominated there. Uh, the Thunderbird and, right. um, you know, all that was a very much a big part of their cosmology, as was the concept of kind of this twin earth notion as well, which mm. is also interesting. Um, you know, it's almost kind of like, uh, you know, an evil earth, like as something you would access, like in the Black Lodge of Twin Peaks to sort of put that into perspective. And um, it's also really present in the other spot, too, in Wisconsin at Devil's Lake. And this mm. wasn't the Baker Ball, mind you. This was Michael Bertrio's group that was, like, operating out of there. But again, you know, this whole area was awash with Native American mounds. I've read that it was there were more Native American mounds in southern Wisconsin than anywhere in the country. I haven't been able to reliably confirm that, but I would believe it. Uh, having driven through it, there are a lot of Native American mounds there. It's estimated at one point there were between fifteen and 20,000 of them mm. built, wow. which is just staggering. And again, I'm not talking about the whole of Wisconsin. I'm talking about just the southern part of the state below the 43rd parallel by and large. Mm. So, yeah, it's quite amazing. Uh, and again, it's just ripe with a lot of that Thunderbird and, you know, Great Horn Serpent uh, symbolism. So, it's really interesting that they also seem to have like latched onto a lot of these sites previously that were connected with these uh, native, these indigenous groups and that particular sort of cosmology behind it. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. He's the, he wrote the, the large voodoo Gnostic yeah, the voodoo book. Gnostic yeah. Hand book. Mm. yeah. 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 And then, yeah, that guy's really interesting. Have you, you've been getting into him a little bit too? Oh, yeah. Well, Bertrio was based out of Chicago, of course, and um, he had claimed to uh, had trained in Haiti with, uh, you know, longtime practitioners of Voodon. Mm -hmm. um, the authenticity of his Voodon is heavily disputed, to just put it mildly there. Um, yeah. Bit of probably more of a cultural appropriation and basically a thinly veered uh, Western ceremonial system that just kind of used some, you know, kind of Haitian and Voodoo terms. But, you know, right. I don't want to digress too much on that. And another thing about Bertrio, too, that's really interesting is he's a wandering bishop. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of another thing you see appear in a lot of these groups. But yeah, he was involved with uh, this circle that was also in contact with Kenneth Grant during the 1970s, and they were doing their own rituals. Um, specifically, they were leaving Chicago and going out to this very peculiar area in Wisconsin, uh, the Driftless area or the Driftless region. It's, you know, already a spot that has a reputation for a lot of high weirdness. Um, it encompasses four states, I believe, Wisconsin, Iowa, uh, Slither of Illinois, and I think Indiana, uh, all the states in that, you know, area that fall in that, that the Driftless area falls into have experienced a lot of high weirdness, but Wisconsin, it seems to be especially prevalent, I think, in like that southwestern corner of Wisconsin that's in the Driftless region, no less than was it, three different towns claimed to be the UFO capital, <laughs> not just of Wisconsin or the United States, but the entire world. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of like the kind of the 
feel for the area there. Yeah. And there's been a lot of weird stuff that's happened there. Um, you know, we just did the farm podcast that was up on Monday on Hakeem Bay. And there's mm. actually this commune Dreamtime Village that's only about an hour or so mm from uh devil's lake that you know they had set up as a commune there that's really big into a lot of bay's ideology and so forth and again you know i mean a lot of weird stuff there there's you know there's also a spiritualist camp that had been set up uh within i think an hour of devil's lake around the end of the 19th century so Mm. for very many years uh Starting with the Native Americans, there were mounds in the Devil's Lake area. A lot of them have been torn down, but there were quite a few substantial ones in there earlier. Uh, going up to modern times, groups have sort of latched onto that region as uh, being very mysterious. And of course, it was also incidentally, I mean, a big part of perpetuating Lovecraft's legacy as well. Of course, this is in Sox City, which is about... Uh, 45 minutes, I think, from Devil's Lake. That's where Arkham Publishing House was set up by August Derleth um, in the late 1930s. And this was basically the publisher that kept the torch for Lovecraft alive. I mean, of Mm. course, they were the first ones to even publish Lovecraft's work in hardcover format. And um, Derleth, of course, continued to add to this Cthulhu mythos. He encouraged a lot of other writers to contribute to it. I mean, he was really a major part of uh, not just keeping Lovecraft, but the mythos alive and kind of coming up with this whole, you know, notion that people could continue to use it as a world building exercise Mm -hmm. after Lovecraft had died. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of another yeah. important component in all of this and you know there were some other interesting people around there i wrote a pretty lengthy essay on the farm's patreon that gets into all the weird characters that showed up in that region before so yeah uh you know there's a lot of weird energy in you know that whole sort of vicinity and um you know again uh not in you know kind of the eastern part of the state i mean later on you had uh just this whole thing with the cryptids and what have you showing up with like the werewolves and bray road and what have you and this is at a time where you know you've got some of these ecclesiastic gnostic churches uh based off of this sort of oto ideology operating in milwaukee at a time when there were rumors that the whole region was awash and cold activity in general so uh you know, again, it's possible that some of this stuff continued, or just in general, it's the fact that the vortex was opened. You know, <laughs> stuff was maybe spilling out again. I mean, I know when I was uh, talking with subliminal jihad guys about weird Wisconsin, they had kind of uh, likened all this stuff to like Stranger Things or something like that. Right, in a lot right. of ways, it's kind of a good comparison. You know, you're doing these sort of weird magical workings, and then kind of suddenly you got werewolves you got goat men turning up you got ufos everywhere just <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i mean yeah i mean it's crazy too mentioning the, the the lovecraft mythos how that continues right up into like something like the ccru still involving themselves with that process but um yeah i, I wanted to talk a little bit about the serpent mound the history of the serpent mound is just so crazy and fascinating i mean I think the first time I heard about it, I was in college. Uh, it was in like a Native American religion class. And um, the professor just kind of mentioned it in passing. Uh, it, just because there's no, so little known about the actual history of the Adena and Hopewell people. But um, mm-hmm. it, yeah, it, it's built upon one of the largest geomagnetic anomalies in the world, um, which is likely... Yeah, that's something that a lot of people don't realize, but it's basically like in the middle of like this giant asteroid, right. or meteorite crater, excuse me. So that was actually something I hadn't even realized until I had gone out there and seen the thing, which makes it even more stranger, because again, if you've ever been out there, you I mean, I know you know, because you've been there, but for those of you who haven't been there, it's like it's on a hill, essentially. And again, you know, this is an area that was flattened by a freaking meteorite and then there's this hill that you know honestly almost looks like it was pulled out of the ground like literally yeah that they built this mound on so just you know the site alone is very unusual i mean you know we walked around the whole trail around it it's very just kind of eerie and what have you it's a very strange place there's all kinds of Uh, just interesting plant life and stuff that grow around there and so forth. Um, It's, 
it's mysterious to put it mildly <laughs> yeah i uh i like to do vlf radio recordings which is uh very low frequency so it picks up um basically the earth field through like radio signals uh, and i was doing some radio recordings there and it was just the thing was just kind of going off you, like a lot of the time it's called a whistler and um during sunsets and locations without a lot of interference it'll kind of pick up these uh, sunspot signals and, and geomagnetic stuff but mm -hmm. when i was there the thing was just kind of going haywire which was wild but um yeah i mean there's also the crazy connection to like john d kind of because uh they say that obsidian was found um I, I don't know if it was the serpent mound but at mounds in ohio they say that shards of obsidian were found which is native to mexico obviously had a huge importance to the aztecs and that's where john d supposedly got his black mirror was um brought back from one of the early expeditions to the new world um, so it's strange that there's this feedback loop of magical workings in Cincinnati, even if that history is maybe hearsay or not, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's well, a few things. Like, first off, we don't actually know if the Obsidian Mirror in the, um, I think it's the London Museum, was used by John D or not. That's a bit of a matter of debate. Uh, hmm. He may not have, but... Um, Certainly, uh, the use of black mirrors and later obsidian was quite prevalent in um, Western European occultism, especially during that whole era. And I should point out, because, again, you know, everybody kind of assumes that John D was like the end all and all of this, that that just was not the case. All kinds of groups were doing their own kind of like scrying thing, especially mm -hmm. like kind of people connected to the Bohemian Brethren and the uh, early Rosicrucian kind of fervor and that kind of thing. But yeah, in the New World, it was also very much a thing. Of course, the Aztecs do appear to have used the obsidian stones for the purposes of what we would kind of think of as scrying. And that also seems to have been a practice done by uh, potentially the Adena, but almost certainly the Hopewell culture. Um, they it probably wasn't necessarily a city and that would have been used commonly. It was like Misa or something like that, which was another sort of like reflective surface that we found without fail and like large denominations in a lot of these mound complexes. Um, there's also a lot of compelling evidence that they used magic mushrooms and their rituals um, and that kind of thing. And yeah, you know, again, it's it's very eerie and i think that this you know cuts to the heart of um why you see a lot of these occult groups coming to these regions because again also with serpent mound it's really controversial as to who did it i mean and in fact i think in a lot of the official accounts it's actually i think the Ford ancient people that are credited with it it's kind of like the same thing with some of the ones in wisconsin too where it seems like the woodland tribes are usually credited even though it's theoretically the mm -hmm. adina or the hopo would have been around there but um regardless though i mean whoever did that it seems that they were using techniques that appear to be remarkably similar to a lot of the stuff that would have been done with you know european ceremonial magic with the black mirrors and the use of entheogens and altered states of consciousness and it also seems like it was kind of towards a similar purpose as i had sort of talked to before or alluded to before some of the theories like with the hopewell for instance is that they were trying to access uh the other world as opposed to the underworld which would have been the dominion of the um you know the great horn serpent and the other right. world would have been kind of equivalent to the other side of grant's night side treat of life or this evil earth was uh where everything was kind of like the opposite if you will right the um, the under what do they call it in the upside <laughs> down stranger things yeah the upside, yeah, the upside down. down world yeah yeah another uh, kind of stranger things connection yeah. so Weird. yeah and i mean it's yeah. it's like a this symbol too is so strange that it has that connotation of like panspermia the serpent eating the cosmic egg like on a massive crater site uh i know grant hamcock writes a lot about the serpent mound and the contested age of the serpent mound um i think in in his book that's largely based in in uh america on the continent um he i think he is putting forth that at the time of the construction, yeah, I don't know. I mean, at the time of the construction of 
the serpent mound um in his theory he's basically saying that the ice wall would have reached like the overlook of the, the serpent mound um so i mean there's just all this interesting stuff with that site um and the the talk of like uh magnetic anomalies being associated with the uh the geomagnetic anomaly like b- people saying that uh stones can stand upright and stuff there and uh, you can read all kinds of strange stuff about it well also you know we can't forget too that the um you know the serpent too is uh aligned towards i think it's the summer solstice yeah the sun sets i think though which is interesting yeah and also um you know i mean several points of like the lunar cycle as well which is also interesting but i mean again you know, if you're going there with the assumption of it being used for these sort of ritualistic shamanistic purposes that I'm alluding to, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, especially if you're actually physically standing in some of the areas there, you know, which I think, I mean, especially where like, you know, it kind of wraps around in the serpent's tail and stuff. I think those were designed specifically to kind of be like vortex points. And again, this is my own particular interpretation, right. but I mean, I know when we were there, we were definitely kind of drawn to a couple of those spots. Um, yeah, those you know, solstice I, alignments are like perfect too. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, yeah. that's coming up too. It's Saturday, not Saturday, when, whenever the solstice is, like in the next few days. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. like around June 20th or something like yeah. that, usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's just remarkable. And I mean, yeah. I definitely think that, you know, a lot of this, it's just, it's fundamentally, I think, rooted in astro theology or Mm. astro magic, you know, I mean, Mm. much like a lot of the uh, classic European ceremonial magic systems, which, you know, then themselves, I mean, go back to antiquity. Um, You know, but again, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, I mean, it's basically this whole concept that, um, you know, you could, uh, go through the sort of gateways of Saturn, if you will, and sort of uh, ascend through the celestial spheres and so forth to return to the Godhead. Um, I kind of think like in a sense too, that, uh, you know, again, to kind of put this in a fictional context, this is one of the things that Kubrick is alluding with Mm. uh, in 2001, a space odyssey. I mean, especially Mm -hmm. the very end of it, we know we get into kind of psychedelic spot. I think that's, you know, he's basically trying to give you a fictional account of what this process would have been like for people, you know, all the way back at the serpent mound. And it's interesting too, when you sort of intersect it with the dawn of man sequence, you know, I think that's (laughs) kind of like, what he's getting at throughout this whole process i mean we first sort of learned how to do these astral journeys in this really primordial time where our consciousness could leave the earthly realm and you know ascend and then of course i mean that's basically i think like what happens at the end even after we've left the earthly realm i mean there's still this process of ascension into what another dimension i mean who really knows but um again you know and it's also aligned of course originally it could it's aligned in the um was an eclipse of jupiter in the movie but it was supposed to be with saturn that was how it was written in the original script and that's uh, typically the gateway that's been used to Saturn. And I uh, think the change was why did they do that change? In right. script? It's interesting. In theory, they said it was because of the monetary constraints or, or the <laughs> fact that they couldn't make like a realistic version of Saturn's rings or something. But uh, I don't know if I buy that because Kubrick, yeah. <laughs> you know, did the special effects as well. I think he would have known what was possible. I think it might have just been because it would have been a little too obvious if they had done the full on thing with Saturn. Because Saturn is like really important in all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And Grant's system uh, um, set is basically the stand in for Saturn. Uh, you know, and again, if you know anything about this, I mean, set is huge. Set and Typhoon are basically right. intertwined with like each other. So, but again, I mean, Grant is really subtle about all of this, uh, even though, I mean, again, he was in literal contact with the Brotherhood of Saturn and Germany. And that was where a lot of his, you know, concepts were coming from. Even he kind of tries to downplay the kind of the, the Saturnine component of his system, if you will. But that was huge in all of this. Have you uh, have you read Tracy Twyman's book Genuflect? No, I have not. Uh, it's yeah, it's fun. It's a sort of hyper, not violent. But it's a very disturbing take about what this kind of magical process of usurping the planets one by one might look like. Mm. Uh, it's yeah, it's her. It was her only novel, but it's it's a. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with the one that I've, uh, yeah, yeah. I've definitely, uh, some people had some very strong reactions to that one, to put it mildly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, it's a gruesome book, but I think it's pretty smart. Um, yeah. I th- maybe we could talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, Stranger Things stuff that's been going on uh, in the pop culture lately. Um, it's kind of fun because we kind of started this conversation sort of off handedly talking about how you're researching the uh, inventor of the gifted program. And I feel like that's kind of, <laughs> it's on a, maybe not even just a symbolic level, but t- it ties in pretty strongly to the sort of stranger things uh, mythology, part of it at least, right? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of this is stuff I'm going to get into with the Patreons. Um, so I can't get into it too much here, sure. but like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, the guy who really kind of came up with the concept of giftedness was like Lewis Terman, um, who's an endlessly fascinating figure. And um, one of the things about this that, that that's really interesting, um, almost all this stuff grew out of like Stanford University, right? Mm. So uh, one of the earliest endowments left uh, was by a member of the Stanford family. And this is all the way back, like in the early part of the 20th century. And it was to research psychic phenomena. And as far as I'm aware, I think this was actually the first time that like a major American university had actually researched like ESP formally and what have you. Like they had a figure in the psychology department coover i think was his name who was doing this research like all the way up to like 1937 on funding from this grant so anyway um they were able to get this member of the stanford family to change the wording slightly on the grant before his death where it was like psychic or psychological research and eventually this grant became one of the principal funding sources of Terman's research on gifted students uh, going into like the 1920s and again I should emphasize Terman you know reportedly despised Coover and the feelings were mutual um you know I don't know how much he really would have bought into the ESP stuff but it's just really fascinating that From the very beginning, there was a lot of connections with this type of stuff. And as we'll get into, you know, on the farm and some of this stuff going forward, like there's always been this strange interconnection between high weirdness and the gifted program. And certainly it Mm -hmm. really started to take off during like the Cold War era. And I mean, I think it's continued to this day, really, where there's also this sort of interest uh, with it overlapping with like ESP and things like that. Um, But I think that if you step back, it makes a certain kind of sense, because, again, uh, within the history of the gifted program, there's always been, you know, the ongoing debate as to, you know, what was the ultimate cause of genius? Is it nature or is it nurture? Mm -hmm. What I mean by that, is it hereditary or is it caused by the environment, if you will? Terman and most of the advocates of the giftedness uh, program and IQ testing and a lot of this stuff believe fundamentally that this stuff was hereditary. That's a big part of why they have, you know, they pushed for standardized testing to be institutionalized and for these intelligence tests to be institutionalized in American school programs going back, you know, prior to the Second World War, Mm -hmm. because they believed that this was something intelligence that they could isolate these tests because it was hereditary and they wanted to take these kids out as much as possible from their peers so that they could be accelerated, uh, you know, and groomed for managerial kind of jobs and things like that. Right. It's so, kind of crazy. Yeah. If you, I mean, yeah, the, obviously, so it's very eugenicist. Uh, oh yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. It yeah. grew out very much of the eugenics movement. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, all of these guys term I mean, all of the original guys were big into eugenics. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, it's like the same thing with, ESP and just sort of broader uh, with people who have been um, involved with a lot of like paranormal experiences. I mean, there is a growing concept that experiencers are, you know, multi-generational or that there are certainly Mm -hmm. family lines that are more prone to these kinds of encounters or having ESP and that kind of thing than average people are. 
So once again, there's this sort of concept of like it being hereditary. And that once again, kind of brings into this sort of slippery slope of eugenics and what have you. Right. Um, And again, I, you know, I don't really know how to totally make sense of it at this point. I mean, I primarily gotten into this type of research because of my own personal experiences like I was explaining to you uh, before, you know, in the last three years or so, that was really for a variety of reasons when my life really started to change a lot. And I started to make an effort to kind of, you know, get back into the field and study a lot of these sites. You know, it began with me uh, going out to Somerset and hanging out with the Penny Royal people. And it's kind of mm-hmm. continued throughout all these other different journeys I made to places like Wisconsin and Utah and one thing you know, for the other. And I've made a lot of amazing friends uh, in this time frame. And the one thing that uh, the reoccurring theme in almost all of this is a staggering amount of them are gifted kids. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I was telling you probably a third, if not you know, even closer, probably to half. I mean, in the case of, Penny Royal, for instance, uh, Nathan, uh, Kyle, and uh, Darren all tested gifted, mm-hmm. as did I. Uh, I mean, as you were just kind of telling me, you tested gifted. John yeah, Brisson from We Read the Document <laughs> tested gifted. Uh, George from Cab Dead tested gifted. Um, it's just insane. I mean, how many of the people that I've encountered, and like I was telling you before, you know, gifted kids, people who have tested gifted, we're only about 5% of the U.S. population, okay? So it's, from a statistical standpoint, pretty staggering that I've encountered so many people who tested gifted. And a lot of times it's been in the context of a lot of this sort of high strangeness and sort of related type of topics as well. So That it's is another strange. Sort of, mm-hmm. I wonder, yeah, if they're like sticking like subliminal cues to make you interested in this kind of thing in their iq tests or something possibly i mean i yeah. think some of it has to do with the uh the alternate reality games which you talked about a lot you know before but again i've encountered mm-hmm. so many people through the process of these different args and so forth and researching them so interesting yeah. it's kind of another thing but i definitely think that there are a certain amount of args that are specifically targeted at gifted for various reasons mm-hmm. so yeah, it's if I mean, I remember there was sort of like a, a sort of scandal in my middle school about this one teacher was sort of you know accusing this whole gifted thing of being like this. He kept calling it like it was like it was Nazi stuff. Like he would say like this is like Nazi stuff. Why are you like? Well, it really is, is. but it I is mean, right. <laughs> I mean, it's not I really. Like, t- I mean, it's not really talked about. But yeah, yeah. like, um, I mean, our basically our entire educational system is organized around a process that is known as psychometrics, if mm. I remember mm. correctly. And um, what this amounts mm. to, you know, was these notions that people like Terman and what have you came up with when they were uh, doing this testing for the military during the First World War. It was these uh, army alpha and army beta tests, essentially. And this was to determine more or less who should be officers and who should be cannon fodder, because it was argued mm. that people who had exceptional skills you know, they shouldn't be put on the front lines to go off to combat, you know, I mean, they should be held back so they can work as engineers or commanding officers or something where you can, you you know, better utilize their skills. We had plenty of the, the feeble minded, you know, to go and fight in the trenches and die there for us, you know, so why squander these precious resources for that kind of thing? So, in the aftermath of the First World War, it was kind of argued that, you know, why should we stop at the army? Why should we, you know, why should we not apply these standards to society at large? And I think that's where we kind of began this process of determining who were alphas, who were betas, who were deltas, and all this other kind of stuff. Mm. And no, that does not validate the existence of monarch. I know a lot of conclusions, <laughs> even though we do test to try to, you know, find who has alpha and beta type personalities. It's mm. not necessarily for the kind of crap that you hear related to the monarch stuff, which is a hoax. I should mm-hmm. emphasize, though it has a basis <laughs> in reality. Right. That's funny. Um, yeah, we were going to, because there's so much monarch bait in uh, the new Stranger Things. Yeah. Um, right. So, yeah, we were going to ask you about that. So, that's what, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, there's even like the obviously the the obvious callback of the rainbow room in in the new Stranger Things, uh, the over the rainbow symbolism in in all the monarch literature and stuff, and the the use of wizard Wizard of the Oz. Wizard of Oz is like of huge Oz. and. Yeah. Or, I mean, maybe it's just an easy metaphor for like you're not in Kansas, like that kind of thing. But, and then, yeah, have, did you watch the new season of that show? No, I, yeah. you know, again, I love the first season deeply, but I just was so disgusted about the later seasons, especially <laughs> oh, yeah. the third yeah. one, man. I just, <laughs> no, it's not good, but I think it's the new, you know, but it's interesting. Like, I mean, yeah. I'm sure it is, but it's just like, man, at this, I mean, I work <laughs> almost 60 hours a week. And I mean, if I only have yeah. so much time at this point to like watch, you know, shows. And frankly, there's sure. a lot of other stuff I would rather watch at this point. I got a new season of Westworld. I mean, coming up here. <laughs> week, man, oh, I, really? I didn't even know there was. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. June 25th. Yeah. 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 I just, you know, I, I think there's better stuff out there. I guess what I'm <laughs> yeah. trying to say, even though I know a lot of people are going to be talking about it. But I mean, right. Yeah, I mean, this kind of stuff, though, does have a basis in reality, and it really is this sort of eugenics program. And I mean, when you mm -hmm. get into this kind of, you know, I mean, most people, when they talk about, like, the educational system, they focus on, like, the dumbing down of it. And I mean, that was very much true for, like, the broader population and that we yeah. were designing a public education system that would be ideal to train people to do meaningless, you know, module uh tasks essentially for the rest yeah. of their lives in factory jobs or whatever mm -hmm. menial labor and then but you know another part of it was that for these alphas you know you did have these uh exclusive programs that were usually driven by this whole ideology of accelerationism mm -hmm. uh, to bump the kids to the you know classrooms as quickly as possible uh, so that they could assume these kind of managerial leadership positions and it seems like in this case you know they were uh, given what would have been considered more like a classical education. I mean, I, right. you know, I didn't actually do the gifted school because of uh, the distance between where it was. My parents kept it out of uh, out, me out of it. But I know from people who did go through the programs, for instance, you know, they were taught like a lot of classical literature and stuff mm -hmm. like that, that they can, you know, compose, uh, what is it, rhetoric. And I mean, the sort of, uh, right. you know, was it the classical triorum to, trioria or whatever the hell it was called i can't mm. remember now i'm probably butchering that but um so this sort of classical style of education that would have been used historically to train the aristocracy was still in place i think in a lot of these gifted programs and then later mm. you just had these uh you know for everybody else you know you got this sort of mass education that like i uh, got you ready you know to do menial labor for the rest of your life mm. with all tasks and that kind of thing yeah so yeah there was very much this kind of eugenics program and um you know i mean i know like in the high school that i went to at spruce creek and uh port orange florida um you know this was really evident i mean even though it's a public school you basically had three right. separate tiers of education you had the yeah, same with me regular yeah. stuff and then you had the you know ap stuff and the honors program and then you had the glorious ib program and uh -huh. the ib kids were like so elite i mean they were basically taught by their teachers to like look down on the rest of the school population i mean i was you know honors ap i was like i think the first student in the entire school to pass like the history exam in like two years, the AP one. And I was still considered dog shit by the IB <laughs> for kids. You know, I mean, it was just insane. They gave these kids like an average of five hours of homework, like a night. I mean, like they literally would go home and do nothing but homework until like midnight mm. or something like that half the time and then go into school the next day. And, I mean, they were literally treated like an aristocracy in the classroom. I mean, they just yeah. I mean, thought the general students were just utterly beneath them. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It's it's also interesting to find, like you were saying, that the amount of like these sort of post gifted kids who ended up becoming adults who like entered into like atypical, like instead of like going into the sort of managerial elite, they kind of ended up in these sort of fringe areas. <laughs> because the culture itself is sort of 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, a fair amount of them do end up in managerial positions. Right. I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, that's what they're being groomed for. But I mean, yeah. yeah, they do, I think, get drawn into some of this other kind of weird stuff. But I mean, it's also, again, I don't want to get into this too much without giving away sure. too many stuff like I planned for the subscribers. But I mean, yeah. gifted kids, I mean, okay, is high IQ and so forth. You're really valuable to the system on the one hand for your managerial talents or potential managerial talents and so forth but let's just say you don't want to go along with the program (laughs) well that could be a major issue because now you have a highly intelligent person who's opposed to the system and especially when you come you know with a high iq often is attached to more volatile personality types like if you're using myers-briggs like intjs intps who tend to be very anti-authoritarian and have you know just in general a lot of problems working within systems create some problems now you potentially got some highly brilliant people who are motivated to bring down the system (laughs) that's also an issue what do you do with them well, I don't know. I don't think maybe you give them drugs. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was like, kind of, oh, I'm sorry, you go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I'm going to explore. But I mean, yeah, that's kind of the other side, though, too, to being a gifted kid. It's, I suppose, in a sense, both a blessing and a curse. Because, I mean, on the one hand, you're seen as possibly future managerial talent, but you're also seen potentially as a major threat to the social order as well that has to be closely managed and supervised. Which, again, makes you wonder why so many gifted kids end up in ARGs. It's funny, like... And it's all sort of based on this IQ testing system that is probably not very uh, reliable. So, I mean, of course, there's like there's a, such a thing as intelligence or whatever, but it's like it's sort of like building this like hierarchy out of, of like out of a flawed system. Oh, very much so. And I mean, that's, you know, I mean, always been an issue. <sighs> From the beginning, I mean, of course, a lot of these guys, as I said, you know, tended to follow the people who advocated the um, intelligence testing, the gift of program tended to very yeah. much fall on the nature side of the nature versus nurture debate. I mean, they had to eventually start making concessions to the behavioralists and so forth. And there has been more of an issue with environmental factors. But again, that's kind of like also given like a justification for separating the students okay so like the theory there the argument kind of goes like okay so gifted kids have natural you know genetic intelligence that they've inherited from their family lines so we need to put them in the right environment where that they can thrive you know with these uh, genetic gifts that they've been given which is why they need to be accelerated through classes or put into special schools or separate classrooms or something and taken away from the rest of the student populace because that environment by contrast will drag them down and they won't reach their full potential so yeah it's uh it's kind of interesting how it's almost been you know when they do acknowledge the fact that environment does play into some of this stuff and that it is a factor it's almost in this warped way mm-hmm. and it just sort of perpetuates this what you're kind of saying is innately already like a flawed uh, system to begin with right yeah it's yeah so i guess the teacher is i mean it kind of is just like nazi shit <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's um which is kind of funny but yeah, it's like I'm getting. Well, I mean, it was a yeah. way, you know, because again, you know, I mean, most of the kids who test gifted tend to overwhelmingly come from like upper middle class backgrounds. And that right. tends to argue very strongly for the environmental factors because they were, you know, also in a position with parents who could spend time educating them and a lot of hands on experience and a lot of other factors that you could throw into that. Um, right. Or at least just in general, they had stable homes, which could help them and, you know, develop their intelligence at younger ages and so forth. I mean, a lot of uh, children who came from less privileged backgrounds, you know, I mean, had to deal with parents who were alcoholics or drug addicts or struggling to find employment or just all this other kind of stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's also essentially a way, I mean, to just uh, make an argument for why you need to kind of perpetuate uh, these uh, 
ruling families and so forth mm. i mean right you can sit there and say like well i mean the rockefeller mm. kids have demonstrated high iqs you know at such and such an age well it's like how many advantages have they been given over the years right. and then i right. mean in the case of like you know terman's initial program it's really fascinating because i mean he at the time had the uh, what was the most in-depth uh, longevity study that had ever been conducted by a psychologist. I mean, it went on throughout the entire lifespan mm -hmm. of the initial group of kids that he designated as gifted. After Terman himself had died, his followers kind of continued the studies on them. I mean, it went on for like 80 years or something like that, wow. okay? So, but okay, so again, the whole thing is like, we're going to study these kids that were designated gifted and we want to see that if the high iqs confirm what we think which is that they'll end up like holding these positions and managerial posts and what have you okay well here's one of the major issues with that terman kept in close contact with these kids throughout most of their lives and usually went out of their way to help them Terman's really influential. He was the head of psychology mm. at Stanford. He knew Herbert Hoover, the former president, and a lot of other powerful people. So it also sort of brings in the question with this initial study into giftedness. Okay, so it proves that, yes, people who tested gifted went into like more exclusive positions in later life than the populace at large. But how much of that was helped by Terman himself and, you know, his followers <laughs> who mm. continued to sort of promote uh, a lot of his kids, you know, later in life? So it's right. even more flawed. I mean, it's just fascinating how much privilege, you know, was used to shape uh, this whole program. And it has, mm. you know, been, is, been used to justify this basic quasi eugenics, eugenics program. I mean, down through the years. Yeah. It's, and it's funny, like the, the parallels with the stranger things and the sort of, with this weird connections happening in my mind where like, not to give you like a spoiler or anything, but it is heavily implied in the new Stranger Things that the sort of portal that opened in that town of Hawkins was caused by one very particularly gifted kid mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in the program that Eleven is in. So it's kind of like, and that kind of reminds me of the sort of strange cryptid type beings and strangeness that comes out of the weird workings of the grant associated things it's kind of it's, it's a funny little mm. uh yeah and i mean you know, and i mean as i get into you know in the patreon stuff i mean it really you know i mean it was the people involved in the i mean especially the cold war era gifted stuff i mean there really was a much more direct connection to this paranormal kind of stuff i mean one mm. of the most notorious people was a wandering bishop <laughs> that alone should just tell you i mean the kind of stuff that they're involved in i mean i already mentioned that michael bertrio was a wandering bishop right. as yeah is for Alan our Greenfield. listeners what's the what is a for our listeners because we, we've kind of heard this throughout the you know this in this environment the wandering bishop connection but for our listeners who aren't like familiar what is the significance of it well, wandering bishops are, you know, essentially ordained bishops uh, who are usually consider themselves to be a part of the true Catholic or Orthodox churches, even though they're not formally members of either one. And uh, a big thing is, you know, they kind of uh, trade off on these consecrations and so forth. I mean, the movement sort of started back in... Well, again, it's debatable, I mean, how long it's been going on, but the, the modern movement kind of got going back in the late 19th century with the old Catholic movement that uh, broke away from the Catholic Church uh, around the end of the 19th century, I think because of the First Vatican Council, actually, if I remember correctly. And anyway, um, this created the phenomenon of like these so-called wandering bishops. They were, you know, there were more schisms as the old Catholic Church went into more and more debates about what the pure church was supposed to be like. And, mm -hmm. you know, the line of succession became kind of an obsession because that was where your legitimacy came from. You know, mm -hmm. you still needed to be consecrated by an actual bishop who had ties to the Catholic Church because in theory, the line of succession there went all the way back to St. Peter. Okay, so... Right. Anyway, uh, the movement got a lot of additional uh, life uh, in the late 60s, early 70s after Vatican II. Once again, you had a lot of Catholic bishops who broke away and started founding their own churches and what have you. So that's kind of like the mainline wandering bishop thing. But 
a lot of people tied into the occult have been obsessed with these consecrations for like a lot of years right? for a variety of reasons. But to be perfectly honest, and this is one of the few times where Satanism should legitimately be brought up, uh, this is honestly one of the main reasons why you would want to be consecrated. Again, you know, for those of you listening to this, okay, I'm talking about historic Satanism which is essentially a Christian heresy. Uh, The earliest accounts I can find of really legitimate accounts of black masses go back to about the 13th, 14th century and continuing up through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance uh, to the 19th century. The reoccurring theme of pretty much all what would be considered authentic Satanism involving black masses and so forth is that it was almost always conducted by a Catholic priest. And there's a reason for this again, contrary to what you see in the movies and hear, you know, from Tex Mars and what have you, not just anybody can perform a black mass. There are very specific requirements for this. Okay. First off, you know, you need uh, implements for it that have actually been blessed, holy water and what have you, and they need to be blessed by an actual ordained priest. Mm -hmm. You can't just go and get tap water and say some all fathers over it and it's good to go. You need a real priest to do this for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you need to perform it in consecrated ground. This is why, again, historically, when you hear about authentic black masses, they're almost always in abandoned churches and stuff Mm, like that because you need a consecrated spot for it. Mm. And thirdly, and this has been the tricky one, you need an ordained priest to perform it. Because, again, it is a mockery slash inversion of a Christian mass. You know, you say the mass backwards, the priest has sex with the the bride or whatever on top of the, um, you know, the altar, all that good stuff. It's, you know, to order for this to work, you need an actual priest to go through this. Mm. And this is why if you're an occultist and you genuinely want to perform a black mass why you would want to be ordained through a legitimate line of succession Mm. because Mm. now you would have a the ability to create you know all the stuff that you need you can make consecrated ground for this and finally you could actually perform the ceremony yourself and it would have legitimacy so to speak so it's kind of like a what would you call that like sort of a like not a loophole but like a yeah like almost like a loophole yeah exactly i mean <laughs> you know but this is why sort of going back with alphias levy Le- levy was actually another wondering bit or he was right. ordained a catholic priest right, i right. know but yeah, right. yeah it's why these guys <laughs> gravitate to this stuff and it's almost always within the vatican and the orthodox churches too i would mm-hmm. add um mm-hmm. but yes Satanism, historic Satanism, was essentially a Christian heresy. My sort of pet theory on that is that it grew out of Gnosticism. You know, again, Mm -hmm. I think there's some truth to the whole thing with the Knights Templar and the, you know, the Order of St. John and so forth. You've got these these orders of knighthood that are going around the uh, the Holy Land back in the day, they start hearing about the Yizdis, the Druze, all these other sort of mystical sects. They're not going to tell them their inner secrets, but they get the kind of, you know, the gist of it. The God of the Old Testament is actually right. this demonic mm-hmm. being. So, okay, well, if he's not the good guy, well, maybe Satan's the good guy then. Yeah. Okay, well, well, then how would we venerate this entity? Let's make a mockery of the mass. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and that connects right back to Grant, too, and the, the Setian, uh, Typhonian stuff. Wild. Oh, yeah. Well, also Tracy Twyman, too, in Batman. Of course. Yep. yep. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. I, we're event, we did a Twyman episode a little over a year ago, and eventually we're going to do another, because that was, like, immediately our most popular episode ever, because people just really love, uh, really love Tracy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask before we duck out because we're getting to that uh, one and a half hour mark. But uh, I was curious if you ever encountered, I'm sure you have, but Arthur Young in your research and what you make of this character. Because 
he's been an interesting figure for me popping up in a lot of stuff um he pops up in the first few pages of the serious mystery by robert temple he's the one who actually gave the the book to robert temple um, which guided him on the path of, of writing about the serious mystery obviously he was also in the nine channeling group with andrija puharik um, he married into the Astor family, uh, his wife, Ruth Young. He was also allegedly hanging out at the Pasadena house uh, with Jack Parsons, um, which that can be contested. But, yeah, I was wondering what you make of this guy. Yeah, I mean, he's a really interesting character, and it is fascinating how he seems like he's seeded like a lot of these movements. I mean, another one, too, that's been really big uh, was the uh, was the fundamental physics group. Mm-hmm. A lot of those guys like Jack Sarfati and what have yeah. you had started out in that kind of like consciousness circle that he yeah. had in um, California, like in the 1970s or something like that. So, yeah, Young is an interesting guy. And another um, individual, I'll tell you, who was a bit of a devotee of Young's uh, was Foster Gamble who of course went on to do the thrice stuff, but um, mm. that whole sort of milieu is interesting because it kind of, it ties into a lot of interesting people, uh, including some of the QAnon types as mm. well. But I mean, you could already sort of see that a bit with Foster Gamble and, you know, how been thrice, I think he brought in like G Edward Griffin, who was like a long time John Burke society member and some of the other mm. stuff into that. So I mean, I don't think that that, you know, was something that Arthur Young was a part of. But I mean, he was a big part of really pushing uh, some of this more mystical interpretations of uh, physics and so forth. Mm. Um, Later, the fundamental physics group really popularized. And I mean, that whole thing is also just the timing of it and what have you is quite interesting because... um, Physics was not very popular in a lot of university campuses in the U.S. during the early 70s because it was so closely associated with the military industrial complex Mm. during that era. I mean, Mm -hmm. you had groups literally like bombing, you know, campus physics buildings and what have you. And then suddenly by the mid 70s, you had like this mystical interpretation coming out of it where it's like being, you know, linked to Zen and yoga and like all this. It basically was this total counterculture spin on it we're like look no see it's really about understanding the nature of being and not about advancing the goal of the military even though we're, we're still you know doing this out of stanford and sri and we're still getting a lot of contact from the military and um, yeah so, yeah wow do you think it was just kind of like a pr campaign that whole thing hmm. yeah you got to kind of wonder about that certainly yeah. especially some of the stuff with puharic and mm-hmm. you know again some of this stuff potentially also ties into the gifted program with bluebird and mm-hmm. well huh. again if, you know I, I advise you guys sign up for the farm's patreon i get into this a lot in the uh the first episode of the gifted program series and i'm going to go even deeper into this in uh future installments because again it also goes into stuff like non-lethal weapons and all kinds of crazy, oh, yeah. crazy stuff. Man. Yeah, all of our listeners, we do advise you to uh, sign up for the farm Patreon. Yep. Excellent yeah, stuff on the stuff. farm. Yep. Been doing some really excellent work over there. Yeah, in the nine channeling group too, you got Carl Beck who comes out of that like mormon radiant energy studies it's wild stuff man but <laughs> oh yeah you gotta have mormons and all this they always turn up man uh, but thanks so much for coming on man this has been a yeah. blast we got into a bunch of different stuff on this episode so it's been an absolute pleasure absolutely yeah i mean let me know if you remember want me back anytime man sure awesome. totally yeah thanks man we appreciate it all right thanks for listening you say no you what i cheated my way into the gifted program Damn. and welcome to patreon <laughs> uh, <laughs> um God, i got that so on. yeah you got me yeah oh uh, man they're gonna take away my my ap your gifted status um yeah i'll did, pass i didn't get to mention it but uh it's crazy i was listening to um 
an interview with Jason Horsley the other day talking about uh, the Vice of Kings. And um, he was kind of talking about things that are uh, analogous to what we were talking about with gift, the gifted program, um, his history of, uh, you know, growing up in school and, and the role of the Fabian Society right. um, in kind of diminishing the rebellious nature of gifted children and stuff. I remember, yeah, you sent me that episode. I remember listening to that. Yeah, we should try and get him. I don't know if he's still doing podcasts, but I'd like to have him back on someday. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I don't know. Let's start off by talking about Stranger Things. Um, yeah, I guess so. I guess uh, spoiler Steven alert. Snyder didn't um, watch it. I'll put a, <laughs> I'll put the, I'll put a timestamp. Um, what, I don't think we need to do that. I, I'm going to put it in. I'll put a timestamp <laughs> in for when we're done talking about it. If if you uh, don't want to hear any spoilers, although we're not really going to be that plot focused, so I wouldn't worry that much um, if you're concerned. It's just a silly Netflix. It's like a Netflix show. Ugh. Yeah, but no, sometimes I, I listen to podcasts. I don't know. I don't want to hear yeah. the, the reveal magnifico of, of the program or whatever. That's true. And that was a very twisty season actually so maybe it is better to not spoil it yeah there's a little bit of an m90 kind of yeah. twist in there um m90 <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah no i i mean it, it's 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 interesting because they they kind of take a turn i feel like for the the first three seasons um and be it be it whatever you think of this show i mean i don't think it's the greatest show ever made obviously there's a ton of uh <laughs> <laughs> nostalgia pill it's very corny yeah um it's it's kind of like certain shows i like to deem you know baby tv like when you're kind of feeling <laughs> yeah. feeling a bit anxious or something there's great shows that are good to throw on and kind of just turn your mind off a little bit like uh right. i've been watching barry you watch barry uh no no i know that you'd like, like for, it in, in a high level anxiety time in my life i watched like six episodes of the Mandalorian in a day. And it was like, my brain uh-huh. was just like <laughs> shutting down. It was great. You came out the other side supporting our police. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know. It's, it did something <laughs> in the, yeah, it, it, it was definitely some monarch mind control where they, they uh-huh. pulled some levers <laughs> in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it like the first season of stranger things obviously has its connections to the intrigue of the Montauk project. Um, right. And it's also like, a, it, like I know uh, Recluse was saying, it, and also I know that guy Chris Knowles says it, that like they love the first season of Stranger Things and they hate the rest of it. And I, I can see that. Like, the first season is far and away like much better and kind of like, Visit and join at patreon.com slash consensus on reality for exclusive episodes written content and more i repeat patreon.com slash consensus on reality for horrible spells and artificially intelligent overlords